tiny in all that air. The Philip Larkin Society Podcast. Hello and welcome to Tiny and All That Air, the Philip Larkin Society podcast. My name is Lynn Lockwood and I'm a trustee of the Philip Larkin Society. And the aim of this podcast is really to find as many different voices as I can to tell the story of Philip Larkin. Today, our guest is Professor James Booth, who is an international expert on Philip Larkin. He is the author of a number of books about Philip Larkin, including the recent biography, Life, Love and Art, a collection of Philip Larkin's letters to his mother called Letters Home. And James also edited the only published edition of Trouble at Willow Gables and Other Fictions, which is Philip Larkin's lesser known prose writing from when he was a younger writer, which are schoolgirl stories and they're fascinating in themselves. James talks to us about how he became an expert on Philip Larkin's life and writing. He also tells us about his days as a young firebrand lecturer at Hull in the 1960s and gives us his insights into Larkin's progression as a writer. Did I work with Larkin? Oh, well, that's a good question to start yeah. with. No. If you read his letters and the reminiscences of the people in the library, you realise he worked very much with the people he got most familiar with. He was a very right. good team worker. But as emerged when computerization came in in the 1980s, it had to be a Brenda Moon who did that because he just really couldn't do it. Yeah. That was, uh, in fact, the university changed basically in 1968, oddly enough, the year I arrived. All these new left-wing members of staff turned up wet behind the ears from Oxbridge and yeah. all over the place. And they weren't the same sort of people as he was used to. Mm. We had a, when I first arrived, 1968 and 1969, there was a huge dinner thrown by the vice chancellor, I think, for new members of staff because there were so many. I think there were 200 because we were expanding. It yeah. was the Franks yeah. report or something, oh, okay. which said that and everyone's forgotten about it. Now it was the age of Heath and Wilson, you know. Which is a huge expansion for yes, all universities. Yes, there was a huge expansion yeah, of yeah. universities. Yeah. And Larkin, of course, um, was increasingly deaf and, mm. and didn't get on with it. Also, he wouldn't have been able to relate to me very easily. I, I think that he would like what I've done if he could look see it you know, from the grave, yeah. beyond the grave. Yeah. And he would probably like it better than most other people. But at the time, he would have detected straight away that I was from a working class background. Although I'd been to Oxford and done the same, pretty well the same sort of degree as he'd done, which yeah. is why... I feel, you know, there is a connection. I'm just 20 years, 19 years later than him. Yeah. Through yeah. the same process, though I went to a grammar school on the state rather than, because that was the days of egalitarianism and so on, mer the meritocracy. And one of these few people who I imagined that's what the future was going to be, that people like me would, uh, and I think this is what the whole world thought, uh, that uh, Oxbridge was going to become you know, a much more egalitarian kind of system. Mm. And it was for a while. And I'm one of the few people who did make good in that system because mm. my, and my parents um, went to university or mm. even, there was no, no books in my house or anything. I just went to a grammar school because of where my parents happened to live. Right, yeah. And got to Oxford. Yeah. So Larkin would have had a very ambiguous attitude to that. Yeah. He was very proud yeah. that he's, he'd been paid for. He wasn't a scholarship poor, yeah. as it were. And he grew um, up surrounded by literature. Yes. Uh, yeah. But his, his peculiar, I think they were very shallow and insignificant, really, but his right-wing prejudices would have kicked in if he'd have mm. met me. And mine right. would have kicked in in relation to him as well. You know, some of the first times I ever registered him was in relation to sit-ins um, about disinvesting in South African companies which paid their workers right. below, their South African black workers below the poverty wage, yeah. Reckitt and Coleman being one of them. Yeah. And Cambridge at that time sold off all its ambiguous shares. Yeah. But Hull, of course, had an entrenched kind of attitude to this and wouldn't do it. And also there were people who were familiar with the kind of Great and the Good in Hull back mm. in the 30s and 40s when 
the shares had been given to found the university, you know, who thought yeah. that it was a betrayal. And I can see their point of view now. Yeah. At yeah. the time, I, I made inflammatory speeches on the steps of the Venn right. building. I'd be sacked right. now. Uh, yeah. but I wasn't sacked then. Um, and had a row with the vice chancellor and stormed out of his office um, about it. Yeah. Interestingly enough, however, he knew who I was. Right. Even though he never came and read, um, uh, however often he was invited, and however well he got on in, in the, within the university committee system with people like Ray Brett, uh, who was the professor at the time. But when, for instance, we got a, a new computer system from Canada, or rather Brenda Moon did, uh, he and the Canadian um, embassy gave a lot of books to the university. Mm. Uh, uh, and a lot of them were relevant to the English department. We, there was a, a little gathering about a little meeting where he accepted it from the Canadian ambassador and so on, not ambassador, cultural attaché or whatever. Yeah. And um, people from relevant departments were invited. And he did the, he was brilliant at that. He did the right thing. He said, and James Booth over there, who was a uh, prominent uh, post-colonial literature and teaches Canadian literature, he, so he knew who I was. Yeah, yeah. Um, he'd done his homework, yeah. even though I scarcely knew him. Uh, and I think that's what he was like, really. He did his job extraordinarily well. Yeah. And although nowadays he'd probably be spat out, chewed up and spat out by the bureaucracy of the system, yeah. because it was very personalised the way he did it. Yeah, yeah. By the standards of the time, he was absolutely brilliant. He yeah. was the most prominent uh, university librarian in the country, yeah. if he, even if he'd never written a poem. Yeah. He yeah. still has a reputation within that rather narrower circle mm. and would still have it. And the Vice Chancellor, Brimmore Jones, bless his cotton socks, is on record as having said that he thought that Lark Larkin was far too much valued for his poetry and it was his librarianship was really <laughs> the distinctive thing about him. But of course, his perspective was that of a, you know, the head of the chemistry department in the university yeah. who had been appointed internally yeah. within the university. Larkin yeah. thought that was, he didn't like that. Um, he never said anything about it in public. And he, he actually proposed that the library should be called the Brimmore Jones Library. Yeah, I think yeah. he realised that that was a mistake later because, of course, it would have been called the Philip Larkin Library, which it should be. Yeah. Um, and Brimmore Jones Library, you know. But, but Brimmore Jones was the key worker in building up the library yeah, along with Larkin yeah, and they worked yeah, together. Yeah. But as Larkin said, and there's a famous little doggerel couplet, if I can remember it, um, Brimble Jones shouldn't be at large. I'm Butter and he's Marge. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a rather low opinion of him. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so the library and its relationship to the academic side of the university was close in some ways. I mean, odd ways. I mean, for instance, um, Professor Saville in um, politics built up a huge collection of um, Labour history, the Labour Party, mm. and um, the um, it's got the archive of um, Liberty, the um, what's it used to be called, the National Association for Human Rights or whatever, I forgot oh, what right. it was. Okay. Uh, but I had a student, I'd, uh, not a student, a friend of mine I'd known in Oxford, and I just met her casually about five or six years after I arrived. I said, what are you doing here? And she said, she was a left-wing person, she said, I'm doing research on on Labour history in the 1930s and 40s. And I have to um, refer to this archive. Mm. And Larkin had got the archive for yeah. the university yeah. because he was very closely friends with Saville. I've forgotten his first name. John Saville, who was a real old-fashioned leftist, you know. And he was helped immensely by Larkin to build up that archive. Yeah. Uh, so... He did his job in a very professional way. When he recognised that someone was doing something original and well, he yeah. simply back gave it the library's backing, uh, even though you might think his prejudices would have been against yeah. it, but they yeah. weren't. And yeah. I don't think he had any real profound prejudices at all. Um, it's all just, um, I'm, you know, unfortunately, whenever he expresses a prejudice, he does it so brilliantly. Yeah, yeah. And it's so... Memorable. Pungently, yeah, but he's yeah. the one who gets quoted. Yeah, when in fact yeah. the prejudice is usually that of his his correspondent that he's yeah. writing to. It's usually yeah. Amos or Conquest, That's and it, he yeah. wouldn't say it to anybody else. Yeah, certainly wouldn't say it to Barbara Pym or to yeah. <laughs> Maeve Brennan or to um, 
her other friends, he would say to Monica, of course, because she was, she was very prejudiced. But uh, no, I, I think that aspect of, of Larkin is very important, his librarianship. And it's important to his poetry as well that he never became part of the literary scene mm. in the way that other people would have done. Yeah. Um, he's called a whole poet. And in a sense, he is a Hull poet. He wrote here, which is the great poet of Hull. And, you know, and um, when um, Imtiaz Darker gave the AGM, uh, this year it was, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. Um, uh, she, she read her brilliant poem, um, By the Tide of Humber, which is... Yeah. Um, uh, uh, re- alludes to Marvell, the, the great earlier poet of yeah. Hull, uh, and is a here kind of poem. She visited the place and was enchanted by mm. it in the same way that Larkin was. Yeah. So, but um, nevertheless, he wasn't working class, which would really be essential if you wanted to be the whole bar. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he had a very, um, um, a, a very oblique relationship to all the labour history and say things like um, the, the trawlers and the yeah. and all of us with, um, um, you know, the headscarfed, um, revolutionaries and that kind of thing. Mm. He, I never knew anything about them, even though it was happening while I was here. And I think that shows that there's a bit of larking in me. You know, I'd come from Oxford and I was mm. treating Hull as a university yeah. rather than as part of the Hull scene. I yeah. regret that now. I Do regret you? it, yes. Even with my working class background, I really couldn't relate to it. And I didn't really get into it properly until I went to see Alec Gill's um, marvellous exhibition last yeah. year, the, the Hull Roaders. Hessel Roaders, sorry, the Hessel Roaders, uh, which celebrates that whole class of people and that now virtually forgotten period. But do you think that's the, the university world, the academic world, even as a, the librarian? It's quite a bubble anyway, isn't it? Yes. And I was in that bubble for a long yeah. time. Along with Larkin, I suppose. Yeah. Although Larkin, of course, really lived a lot of his literary life elsewhere. So he would go to Oxford quite quite mm. often, and mm. he would always go to London every few, every two or three months. He had to go because of his work. But yeah, every yeah. time he went, yeah. he, he would take Monica. He would always go to the to the cricket every year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, pretty well every year to Lords or occasionally to Headingley. He would go to um, is that Leeds? Leeds, Leeds. Yeah. Um, and complain about how how rotten the English team was. The English. <laughs> whatever you call them, the English team. <laughs> anyway, were compared with the West Indians, you know, yeah, which yeah. he didn't like at yeah. all. The, the racket the West Indians would make with their rattles <laughs> and so on. God knows what he would make of Vuvuzela and so on. But um, yeah. so the idea that he was the hermit of Hull was an attractive one to him mm. and he played up to it. Yeah. And in a sense, it's true. When he found that upstairs flat with the high windows in yeah. Pearson Park, yeah. it was his perfect place that's why he stayed there he said yeah. no place was you know he, he could live anywhere as long as he had his health and um could be on the edge of things yeah i like hull because it's so far away from everywhere else you know? yeah yeah <laughs> um, yeah as someone once said he said possibly quoting himself i don't know um or possibly quoting his mother um anyway um but private as he was in that you know, intimate area yeah. of his life. Um, he, he did live quite a quite a public life, both as a librarian and as a poet, mm. going down to London all the time, mm. going to see the cricket, going to meet friends and to participate in... Well, of course, he was on the um, Manuscripts Committee, that Manuscripts Committee, wasn't it, the, for contemporary poetry, yeah. which yeah. he, in yeah. fact, helped to promote, to set up. And um, yeah. he was a very good um, chairman of that committee. He had to go down to meetings all the time. So he was involved with the Poetry Library in <clears throat> yes. London, wasn't he? He was involved in all kinds of ways on the edge of the poetry scene because, of course, he was such a distinguished poet. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and, and so um, his name, uh, his name um, mattered. Yeah. yeah. And so the idea that he, he was a Hull poet or the hermit of Hull it must be taken a bit with a pinch of salt, mm, I think. Yeah. Although he didn't travel abroad very much, of course. No, no, he didn't like to travel abroad. No. He said he'd like to go and see 
He would like to go and see the Great Wall of China as long as he could get back there and back, back in one again. day. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Which is yeah. the way I feel in That's a way. Great. Yeah. And when someone told him they were going on holiday abroad, he said, but how can you drink the water? <laughs> that was you know that's what you did think in those days yeah, it was true yeah, you know you, yeah you could get awful illnesses yeah were you a fan of his poetry then at that point yes that's the old thing I, yeah. I knew that i i knew that he wouldn't get on with me and i wouldn't get on with him and i never tried to get to know him I, unlike andrew motion i never uh, well i wasn't a poet so i suppose i felt it would be impertinent but um had he been more approachable yeah i probably would have uh, but in fact the people he tended to associate with were the people who gathered at the bar at lunchtime. Right. Of course, there was a bar on the yeah. campus then. Yeah. At lunchtime where you'd... There were some some professors, a few other members of staff, and also gardeners and people like that yeah. used yeah. to have a drink at lunchtime. Yeah. And he would join them. And so there was this group. I, I, I interviewed them when I did my biography. And it was interesting. He had absolutely no class consciousness there. He, yeah. As long as they would be sitting at the bar drinking, he yeah. would be part of their group. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, at one of those meetings, that's when I had my famous, you asked me about my relationship with him. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know what I was doing. Because at one of those bar encounters, he was there at the bar, which would then be where the Jubilee Room was now. But in the, I don't know what it is now, but it was the Students' Union mm. uh, for a while, but there was also, the, it became a staff place. There he was having his liquid lunch with this group of people yeah. and they were chatting. And one of them asked him and said, what do you make of this bloke who's going around the university with a petition against investing in uh, c companies with South African interests? Mm. And very fortunately, uh, a friend of mine who I happened to know, otherwise the story would have been lost, happened to be just on the edge at the bar, yeah. you know, having his half or his shandy or whatever he had. They were having their full pints yeah. or whatever. Um, and he replied to whoever it was who'd asked him. He said, um, he's doing um, a sterling service, a, a public service. It'd be useful to have a complete list of all the pricks in the university. <laughs> And I, 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 I used to dine out on that story. I loved it. <laughs> and I never took offence at it, oddly enough. Yeah. Because somehow or other I knew it didn't, it didn't matter because I knew the poetry. And yeah. I would sit in Loughton Hall on the third floor overlooking what was then the cricket pitch. It's all built over now. On a Sunday I would sit there or even higher up. Did I know someone on a higher floor? I probably did. And you would look down over the um, cricket pitch and the on the side that I was looking at, it was the rugby pitch, in fact. And as the dusk descended, I would put on the records, the old vinyl discs mm. of the less deceived and high oh. windows. And I would listen to them all the yeah. way through just as though it was Mozart. Yeah. yeah. And it is Mozart yeah. in words. And yeah. there's almost no poetry like that. Shakespeare's yeah. like that. Yeah. Some of Yeats is like that. Yeah. Some of the 18th, 17th century poets are like that. Mar Marvell is like that. Um, when you, Once you know the poem, you can recite yeah. it from beginning yeah. to end. And it yeah. sounds like music. And I would go through all the emotions, as he said, you mm. know, that he mixes the poems as a long philosophical poem and then a short joke poem and so on bring on the girls you know and they vary so he would he read and he read them all through yeah on those discs yeah. and i did i never got the um high windows disc but those two discs so way back and in fact i think i wrote in my diary when would this have been the 1970s it, it was late enough that, that what I was talking about hadn't got his signature on. But I got a library fine and I complained about it. Right, yeah. I said, look, I brought these books back a day late. Yeah. I was allowed to keep them a whole year because I was a member of staff. I just had to renew them. I took them all away again. I was a day late renewing them. And I was charged sixpence each for whatever, yeah. you know. And isn't, wasn't this a bad thing? I got, you know, I was, a, I was an insufferable little twerp <laughs> at the time. But, um, and uh, he wrote me a beautiful little pompous letter saying, you know, you wouldn't realise how many books are go missing from the library or are stolen. And I did find out later that quite a lot of 18th century books had just been stolen oh, from gosh, the library yeah. by a, a, a book dealer. Uh, I'd been delighted when I first arrived and I'll to see that they were still on the bookshelves. Mm. And of course, it's a dangerous thing for a yeah. library. Uh, and he did himself steal a book from a library when he was a student, so he knew about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, 
and even from Backwells, they could, they could, can they do his estate now? That would be Gosh. interesting. Yes. Uh, and that was one of the ones he didn't sign them because he stopped signing. That his, was done. Uh, yes, he sent, he sent me this note about the um, fine. And up until a certain period, in the 70s, I think, mm. early 70s probably, students had realised that if they got a fine, they would get a note signed by <laughs> Philip Larkin yeah. saying, you are overdue these books, please yeah. return them. And so they deliberately got fines. Of it. And so he got wise to that. And he got a stamp instead <laughs> with his signature. And I think, I think I've still got it somewhere. I, I might have lost it. I hope I haven't. Um, this slightly pompous letter. But I wrote in my diary, I have just received... Uh, with pride, I have just received <laughs> a memorandum from the great, from the greatest poet in England at the, at the moment, mm, yeah. s- saying, you know, and this thing about the library thing. Yeah. Um, interesting kind of double think on my part, isn't it? Yeah, but, and it is um, like the kind of rock star poet. Yes, Go and, um, and play the I just knew it didn't matter, and that somehow or other the the part he was playing as the um, right wing mm. kind of old buffer was just a part. Yeah. And the poetry, as everyone who re- reads him realises, it's the poetry where you get the truest version of the person. With most poets, of course, who aren't so good as him, mm. you can find out things which the po- aren't in the poetry mm. and they're more important things yeah, yeah. about what they're hiding yeah. and what the poetry mm. doesn't have in it. Larkin isn't like that. The truest Larkin um, is the Larkin of the poetry. Mm. And when you get to some of the letters, they're good reads, actually, even the ones that have got the most fruity, awful, you know, things to be ashamed of in yeah. them. They're brilliantly yeah. expressed. You yeah. can't, you can't yeah. say that you don't want... You wouldn't have them not written no. somehow or other. No, when you're writing to your friends, yes. you write... It's performative. It's that audience. It's, yeah, and it's he was, he, if, he was yeah. nothing if not a performer. When yeah. he said, I don't like going around pretending to be me, that's exactly what he did like mm. doing. Mm. But he knew it, and he knew it was dangerous to do it too much, which is why he fought shy of lots of publicity. He wouldn't be able to do it now, mm. and he would get coarsened by it. But in those days, you could still remain a private person. Because he display, he had diaries that were disposed yes. of. That and right? I think that's a great tragedy. Andrew Motion yeah. thinks that they were full of masturbatory fantasies and appalling stuff that he would have been ashamed of. I'm absolutely sure they weren't. They were mm. full of... It, well, they would have had some things, some things like that in, like Byron's letters do, you know, mm. Byron's diaries and whatever. Um, and they were, unfortunately, a lot of them destroyed. Um, and I think um, they would have had marvellous stuff in them. They would, have, yeah. they would have had some great literature in them. And it's mm. such a shame that Betty destroyed them. Mm. Uh, she kept the um, covers, and the covers have little bits pasted in them, right. little pornographic photographs and little <laughs> bits out of poems and Hard, Hardy's famous comment um, that the poet should move his reader's hearts by showing his own mm. and things like that. Mm. Uh, so you've got this tantalising glimpse of what there was and then all you've got are the the threads which had bound the pages oh, in, which she yeah. put into the incinerator. And I often wonder, he did say from quite early on, that he wanted his diaries destroyed. Mm. So maybe he made a distinction. At other times, he would say that he realised after he died, Anthony Thwaite says this, and he would say, oh, well, after my death, this will come out, and it, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Why should this man have written this about me, my childhood, his old school friend, Noel Hughes, I think, um, the snake, you know, why didn't he wait until after I was dead? Yeah, you know, yeah. You think, ah, oh, he's got a sense he knows. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder whether he would actually have really wanted his diaries to be destroyed. So I'm not sure he was quite himself from June to December. And that was when he said... And that's when he changed his... Uh, that's when he got very earnest about destroying the diaries and when he right. made a new will, right. cutting out Maeve. And... It's in my biography. Mm. Um, he was visited at that time by all his friends. Betty thinks she spoke to him the day before he died. She didn't. This was when she spoke to him. She gets it wrong and she won't be persuaded. <laughs> she still says, but she didn't see him the day before he died. He, he, he didn't speak from the time he collapsed in oh, right, Dece- yeah. on December the 2nd yeah. until he died in the early morning, um, December the 1st, I think, probably. And um, I think his relationship with Maeve had always been problematic in some ways, because really they weren't matched. Um, 
uh, you know, the fact that she went off him after he died because she said, my hero had feet of clay, didn't he? Mm. Um, mm. And she had never known that he used four-letter words, you know. And, I mean, what, how blind have you got to be yeah. to, you know, and to be shocked by it yeah. in a profound yeah. way and to think it really mattered. Yeah. She, she changed her attitudes as the years went by after he died. Right. She began to realise that she would, you know, being a, a whole Catholic girl who lived on Beverly High Road, just yeah. around the corner here, all her life, daughter of a dentist, that she had rather a rather closed mind on some things. Mm. And she opened her mind as the years went by, talking to people who'd known Larkin in different contexts. Yeah. But immediately after he died, she was very shocked and, mm. and very... So I, th I think when he changed his will... I don't know, I, th I think something in me, and of course he'd been very rude to her when he'd broken it off with her mm. earlier on. And I think he just realised it had come to an end and he, he wasn't, and, and occasionally he could be quite rude and cruel to people, mm. only very occasionally. Usually he was the opposite. Usually he got himself tangled up with people because yeah. he wouldn't hurt their yeah. feelings. So yeah. he, he yeah. carried on with people. Yeah. No, I feel that his whole relationship with Monica for in an odd way was driven by the fact that he, he felt he owed her in some profound way. Mm. He didn't really. So this is where we leave James for now. Thank you very much to James for his hospitality and looking after us when we came to visit him in Hull. And look out for part two, which will be with you very soon. This podcast is produced by Simon Galloway and the music is provided by The Mechanicals. Please follow us on Twitter at tiny underscore air and why not have a look at the society website at philiplarkin.com there's lots more information there about podcast episodes you could buy some philip larkin merchandise and even become a society member please tweet us your thoughts and if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast we'd love you to get in touch the horns of the morning are blowing are shining the meadow is wet with the coldest of dew. The dawn reassembles.